Welcome back to the wonderful world of pathology, and we are starting the chapter two mini lecture. Uh, we are covering assessments and documentations in this chapter, which include the client intake, consent, and by that I mean enthusiastic consent of the client for the therapy you are offering, and treatment planning. When a new client walks into your office, or even a client you haven't seen in a while, you need to make sure that you are on the same page. And in order to make a decision on what type of treatment you're going to give them, you need to first find out what type of treatment they want. So in this chapter, we're going to be talking about how to complete an intake form or have your client complete an intake form. You need to discuss the treatment goals. What is that client looking for during this massage? What do they want to achieve by having this massage with you? You need to find out what their preferences are. Do they hate music? Are they allergic to oil? Are they allergic to latex? Do they like deep tissue? Do they have fibromyalgia? You need to review their previous treatment plans if you've worked on them or if they have seen a therapist before you, what they liked, didn't like, what worked, what didn't work. And you need to find out what medical testing has been done. Have they been referred by a doctor, a physical therapist? Did they just come in themselves because they want to de-stress a little bit? And you need to make sure that you are qualified to give them the level of care that they are requesting. Another thing that we're going to cover in here is scope of practice and standards of care. For standards of care, please refer to your full chapter two PowerPoint. And this one, we're mostly going to focus on the intake form, client preferences, and the scope of practice. What is a scope of practice? So when you're within a licensed profession, your scope of practice are all of the professional activities that you can legally perform. And these are normally defined by the state law. Uh, they do vary from state to state. Even though the MBLEX covers 22 different states, that all 22 states take the same test to get the same kind of license, each of those states vary in their laws and what you're allowed to do as a massage therapist. So make sure whatever state you're living in, that you are absolutely following the letter of the law for that state. Another thing to watch out for is this bullet number three here. If tasks are delegated to the practitioner, meaning the massage therapist, they must be within the practitioner's scope of practice. That's a slippery slope when you're working in a chiropractic office or a physical therapy office. They may ask you to do things that a PTA would do or um, some other type of assistant would do, a medical assistant. So make sure that these things are either being put underneath the chiropractic license or if you're unsure that you can legally do it within the office, investigate and refuse. Always protect yourself and make sure that you are staying within your scope of practice. To discuss scope of practice, I'm going to lean on the age old teen magazine practice of listing what's hot and what's not. So what is hot as a massage therapist is conducting a proper assessment, taking appropriate documentation, obtaining enthusiastic consent for treatment, and using manual touch therapy techniques. Now, I'm not sure what mechanical appliances they're referring to in this slide from your textbook, but you can use things like pressure tools, hot stones, uh, different scraping devices, stones sometimes as well that are carved or fashioned into massage wands can be used and you can do passive movements for stretching and joint mobilizations obviously you use oils and creams so you can use lubricants although essential oils can be dangerous if you don't know what you're doing uh, depending on the allergy of the patient 
Um, there can be medical implications for some essential oils, especially if the strength is too high. And liniments is kind of a, hmm, that's a fine line. I mean, can you use va Vicks Vapor Rub? Yeah, sure, but could it also be construed as an over the counter medication? You need to be very wary of that strange line with those and be very cautious of it, especially with even creams and such that use something like Arnica. Uh, Arnica is great for a ton of the clients that I've seen. It, it works wonderfully. I am one of those people that gets tachycardia. I get an extremely increased heart rate. Uh, my chest feels fluttery. I start to get extremely flushed. <laughs> so I can't massage with it, um, even if they want me to, to massage it on them. Um, another thing that you can do is hot and cold applications, um, either with hydro packs, hot stones. Ice massage is fantastic, and so are cold packs. What's definitely not hot <laughs> is acupuncture. You are not an acupuncturist. Chiropractic maneuvers, you are not a doctor of chiropractic. Ultrasound and electrotherapy, um, it depends on what state. Uh, where I got licensed, we definitely used ultrasound, we used electrotherapy, and we did electronic nerve stimulation, uh, like TENS units, all the time. Injection therapy is definitely out. Most medical assistants do not even do that. That's typically something for an RN, a registered nurse, or higher to do. Dietary counseling, absolutely not. Cosmetology or beautifying procedures, uh, waxing, hair extractions, and electrolysis. Now, if you are also licensed in those fields, sure, you can. But as a massage therapist, strictly, absolutely not ear candling is one of those that is allowed in some states it is not allowed here it's also pretty dangerous if you do it incorrectly you could cause ear infections please don't and even though it feels like we are conducting psychotherapy sometimes do not give your clients advice you are certainly allowed to listen to them and allow them to vent as they often have a somatic release during the massage session but you are not allowed to give advice you are not a talk therapist you are a touch therapist here's a little bit of chapter one review contraindications it's a condition which could be aggravated by massage could be made worse and your book states that an absolute contraindication is a condition which makes receiving a massage inadvisable. No, it is just a dead stop. No, it's not just inadvisable. It is do not do it. Remember, it's our fever red alarm blaring. Just stop. You can postpone it if it's a condition that is just in its exacerbation stage and it'll end up going away. But if it's something like uh, very acute, absolutely stop. And don't come back until they say, you know what, my doctor cleared me and they can show you proof that it's no longer an absolute contraindication. Now, local contraindication is a condition where local massage is inadvisable, like a boil or a rash. An endangerment site is an area containing structures that can be damaged by applied pressure, uh, like the throat, the back of the knee, deep in the armpit, these type of places, the temple, you're not going to do deep tissue here. Okay, documentation, absolutely important. Write down all the information that you collect from your client. Things that happen during the session, things that the client tells you, things that you need to notate for the doctor, keep a copy of the prescription if there is one. Uh, notate anything that you see on the client's body that, you know, may be a possible injury um, or something, even if they hadn't mentioned it. I have actually been called into court before um, after massaging a client who had large, obvious hand print shaped bruises on them um, and they were suing their spouse for domestic violence uh, divorce and trying to get a restraining order 
And as I was someone who saw those bruises on that person's body, um, they requested all of my documentation and my personal testimony to let them know what was going on during the court case. Now, the types of documents that you're really going to be focused on in general in your office is an intake form, which is always completed by the client. And you typically only update those if the client has moved, their information has changed, their reason for seeking massage has significantly altered in some manner, or you just need to do a general annual update to make sure that it's up to date. There's also the consent form. Um, I like to add my policies in there like no sexual conduct policy or cancellation policies, but you also include what you are or are not going to do to the client during these sessions. And this is where they sign the consent form. The treatment plan is sort of like your soap note and you are filling this out um, what they've told you what you've observed what you've done what you recommend doing in the future and you need to sign it and you need to date it and you need to print your name and it's appropriate usually to put the time that you actually signed it on that date. Another thing that your book has not mentioned here that I highly recommend is if for some reason it's not included in the notes above, put the time, the amount of time that you spent working on that client. Um, I frequently record mine in units. A unit is typically 15 minutes. Um, massage is billed on insurance in units. So that is typically what I place on my personal intake forms in my office. Tips for documenting. Obviously, you're going to write legibly. You want to use commonly accepted medical abbreviations. You want to use blue or black ink. And you want to correct errors with a single line through the writing with your initials and the date by the initials. You cannot scribble it out. You need to still be able to see what was there originally because you are now changing something that you had written down before. You need to record facts and only the facts and your professional opinions and judgments based on those facts only. Now, factual recording means that you are putting things down that are true and only things that are true. If you falsely document anything, it can place blame not only on yourself, uh, but on other therapists, other healthcare practitioners, and it can create an event that is not true. So for instance, that client who wanted documentation from me because I had seen their bruises, had I put that in someone else's file, not only would it look like that client never had bruises when they came to see me, it would make it look like a different client actually did have bruises, uh, which could lead to some very uncomfortable questions for them. You also cannot promise or assure clients of an improbable positive outcome, okay? You are not a snake oil salesman. You cannot promise people that you are going to cure anything, that you're going to completely relieve their pain, that they're going to get their full mobility back. These are not things as a massage therapist that you can definitively state it is illegal, it is out of your scope of practice, and it is highly unethical. HIPAA, you are required to safeguard that client information, whether it is written, whether it is spoken to you, if it's recorded in any manner, or if you have it in some sort of digital format. These privacy guidelines are underneath federal legislation, as well as some state laws. The biggest of which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, HIPAA, and the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. These are highly important for you to remember. Okay, now that you know that you need to keep the information private, we need to figure out what information you actually need. So on the intake form, you need to collect the client's basic health history. Um, you also need to get their medication information, injury information, allergy information, and this is all done either before or during their initial appointment with you. 
And before you do any subsequent sessions, anytime you see them again, you need to ask about changes in either their health, medical status, I would say mental status in terms of stressors, things that they might be seeking changes in the massage therapy plan, all right? All of these affect your treatment and planning. And as we stated before, every year your client needs to sign a new intake form to make sure all of that information, most especially the medical information, is up to date. After you've done the initial intake, it's time for you to delve into a more acute interview about their current status, their current level of stress, their current level of pain. And one way that we do that is using a pain and stress level assessment. Now, I have included this file in your week one file folder if you would like to download it. It's just a universal pain assessment tool. Um, it's in several languages, which I like, but they can go from a number of zero to 10. They can point at, you know, smiley or frowny faces um, to sort of let you know where they're at, either with their activity um, tolerance, how high their pain is, how they feel throughout the day with their pain. It's a very useful tool, especially when you're doing pediatric massage. So now we're just waxing poetic about the intake form and this client interview, but the client interview is extremely important. Not only are you asking about these pain and stress levels, you're asking about their allergies, you're asking about you know, what their preferences are, why are they there to see you as a massage therapist, but you really need to be aware of how you are exchanging that information. You need to be open, you need to be polite, you need to be actively listening to your client. This is absolutely vital. You're going to greet them by their name. You're going to introduce yourself. You're going to go over the intake form that they have filled out. You're going to make sure that it's dated and it's signed by the client. You're also going to sign and date it that you've reviewed it. And you're going to talk, not just read on the intake form about their current health and medical issues. You're going to ask them what the focus is or the purpose of the massage. Are they there for pain reduction, stress reduction? They just want to smell some lavender. Ask them, especially since they may have received a prescription from their physician to come and see you. Now, while you're doing this pain and stress assessment, these pain related questions are super awesome. You ask, when did it start? What makes it worse? What makes it better? Ask them to describe it because joint pain and muscle pain and bone pain, nerve pain, all feel very different from each other. Ask if it radiates, you know, if I poke you in the shoulder, does it hurt all the way down your arm? Where exactly does the pain start? And how often does it hurt? And how much does it hurt when it's hurting? Again, cover client allergies. Absolutely, you need to find out if they're allergic to latex, certain laundry detergents, wool, oils, anything. If they have severe allergic reactions, if you do not have an EpiPen um, in your facility, then definitely ask the client if they keep one on hand. This is vital. This is a super important topic that I wish were covered fully in every grade school across the country and in every home. The elements of informed consent for everything in life, but specifically here for massage therapy. You need to give full disclosure, include all the benefits of massage that are factual, and all of the risks that are potential and factual. You need to make sure that it's voluntary. They want the massage. They're not being pressured into it or coerced. It's not a husband making sure that his pregnant wife is getting a massage to make her relax because she's being moody, but she's nervous about getting a massage because she doesn't want to do anything to potentially damage the baby and doesn't really want to do it. 
that is coercion that is being pressured into getting a massage that they do not want you need not only consent you need enthusiastic consent okay i guess or sure are not enthusiastic answers it's not a firm yes i am interested in receiving this you also need to make sure that they are competent they need to have competency they need to understand the information that they're being told and the consequences of their decisions you know if you have a pediatric massage or if you are massaging someone who is mentally disabled in some way to the point that they are no longer competent you can get that approval from a parent or legal representative um, say it's someone in hospice that is non-verbal, non-responsive, they're in a coma, a family member can absolutely give consent for that massage and then you can move forward. The last little bit that chapter two really focuses on that I want you to pay attention to is soap notes. Some of you have already done your soap note assignment. Um, it is it stands for subjective, objective, assessment, and plan portions of the massage therapy session. We will go over this in more detail in the soap note section, but I did want to pull this out of your general PowerPoint and just reiterate, soap notes are the ones that you really need to pay attention to. Um, in the main PowerPoint, there's like three or four different types of notes um, that different offices take. For massage therapists in the United States, the soap notes seem to be the primary type of note that is being taken. Absolutely glance at the other ones, but really put your focus on the soap notes. And I will see you next time for chapter three.